The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Taking Notes. So this isn't really a second debate review, even though it's a, about the fact that we ended up having a false start of debate. So the quick backstory is that uh, I debated Stuart Connectly on whether or not there's strong evidence for God. That debate's already been posted this month, as has the debate review. Uh, but that debate started and I was sitting there taking notes and he gave his opening statement, his opening remarks. And then we had connectivity issues, so we had to postpone the debate for a couple of days. And when we did the debate, started it back up again, we just started over. And so he gave a different opening statement. I'm not here to compare his two opening statements uh, and, and try to talk too much about what went on in his head. Um, there were bits of conversation that we had that may have impacted any changes to the to the opening statement. But a lot of it is Stuart operates like his dad and a little like me. I don't do notes for most of these videos. Or I'll do some notes and jot down ideas, but I don't write up a speech. I've, with maybe two exceptions, uh, I don't tend to write an entire speech or an entire opening. Everything is loose and, but I do tend to have like some kind of outline and, and guide. Um, Stuart didn't seem to have that. He just sat down and went, okay, uh, is there strong evidence for God? Here's what I think. Now, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with somebody just telling what they think. It's one of the reasons I think Stuart and I got along is that we work kind of similarly. similarly but I took notes. And I wanted to talk about those notes today um, and how this particular set of notes is changing the way I do a number of things. So... I'm going to go through this. I'm going to point out what I can't read anymore. I'm going to point out what I was thinking at the time and where I suspected it was going. So it's kind of a behind the scenes of how and why does Matt take notes. Some of these are uh, not going to be very easy to understand or even remember specifically why I wrote it down. So one of the things that I've learned <coughs> is that, uh, well, I didn't learn this. I know I've never been particularly great at note taking. Um, if you go through, I have notebooks at like every debate. And what will end up happening is it's not that I'm writing this down so that I can go back and reference it to get something word for word. I'm never taking word for word notes. I'm not that fast. I'm not that fast even if I was typing, even when I could type 90 words a minute, which I can no longer do because my pinkies don't work and I don't have to type as much. But when I'm taking the notes, it's to hit the big ideas and I don't have a system. Uh, I have a quasi system that I make up on the moment. And so, Front and back of this sheet represents the entirety of the notes that I took on Stuart's initial opening, which I think was 10 or 15 minutes. And what I have written down here is that it's Stuart Connectly and strong evidence. That's right at the, t well, all right, we're, we're not going to do that because the manual focus is set and you don't need to see how bad my handwriting is. But at the top, it's, I have strong evidence in Stuart Connectly. That's just to let me know that's what this page is. What I have written down here is the best evidence is Jesus Christ, which was something he said in his init initial opening that I don't think he did in the, in the follow-up. Um, and I circled that because what I'm thinking is when he says that the best evidence, the best, the strongest evidence for God is the nature, character, life, and existence of Jesus Christ, death, resurrection, etc. Basically the biblical narrative. Now, I'm not a mythicist. I'm fine with the notion that there probably was a person. I could be wrong. Uh, I also don't have large objections to mythicism done right. There are mythicists, I think, who go way too far and are conspiracy theorists and, and assert things that they can't demonstrate. Uh, trying to counter one unfalsifiable proposition by having a second unfalsifiable proposition isn't really the way to go about doing things. But I, want, I wrote down that I'm not a mythicist specifically because if he was going to try to argue that um, Jesus existed, even though I'm not a mythicist, that's a steep hill to climb. There's still a lot of work to be done to demonstrate the truth of any proposition about Jesus, his birth, his life, his words, uh, his deeds, we have a handful of stories that are copies of copies of translations of copies by unknown people. Uh, and, and no way to investigate it. Even if Jesus himself had written a gospel, which, hang on, why is that a bad idea? Even if Jesus had written a gospel, 
and we had a good trail of evidence showing it went back to a person named Jesus. That still doesn't tell us whether or not anything in the gospel is true. So he started off with the best evidence is Jesus Christ. And I was sitting here thinking, I, I remember distinctly, wow, this is not going to go well if the strongest evidence is something that, you know, you can't even show is real, let alone that it's evidence for the proposition that a God exists or that Jesus was divine. But right off the bat, he immediately acknowledged that he cannot offer a watertight argument. Well, this was first of all about, about the evidence. But when he said, and I wrote down watertight, so I, I know that's the word that he used in the first opening statement. To me, that conveys the notion that he's basically acknowledging, I don't have a way to prove God to you. I don't have a way to demonstrate that God actually exists in a way that most people would accept. I can't present scientific evidence. I can't present evidence that would go in the courtroom. I cannot present a watertight case for evidence. That is an admission that you do not have strong evidence. Well, you know, by using the term watertight, it's a little disingenuous. I don't mean consciously. I don't think Stuart is intentionally being deceptive. What I mean is, when you say, I can't present a watertight case, the truth is, you can't present a case. And nobody's asking for a watertight case, just a reasonable case, a case with strong evidence. Not, this is a slam dunk, you can prove it. Not, this is almost mathematics in the ability that, to which you could prove it. So when he said it wasn't watertight, but Jesus is the closest, closest that we can get. He also said that he thought that we should all be rational and square um, our beliefs with our experience. Now, I agree with all that. I just don't think it should be uh, limited to our experience. One of the things is, is that I wrote down here, use understanding of experience. And that's because when he said, um, we should square things with our experience, I immediately went to, hang on, my experience could be a delusion. And, and plus, we're not, we can't present the evidence of my experience. We can present my understanding of my experience. So if I say, I saw something, and to me, it appeared to be a ghost. Now, that's testimony. It's not presenting evidence beyond the testimony. Um, and it's not, what we, what we end up doing as a shorthand is we say, ah, Matt saw a ghost. That's a piece of evidence. No, no, no. Matt saw something and described it as a ghost. What we have to do is get to the, the heart of, did, did this in fact, was this a ghost? What made him think this was a ghost? And so what we're often talking about is not our experience, but our understanding of our experience. And our understanding of our, our experience uh, can be uh, biased and flawed. We, we know that there's unreliable unre un uh, testimony. But then he said that this wasn't a scientific question. And I... Uh, I understand that, and on one hand, I would agree that the supernatural isn't currently isn't something we can evaluate with science. But if people are saying that they do have good evidence for it, then that is something that science could evaluate. Uh, I don't know how you get to how you can call anything good evidence without it being examinable, at least cursorily, by the scientific scientific community or in a courtroom. And then he went on to describe a lot of things that make him that he thinks are strong evidence, even though none of these are evidence at all. A sense of cosmic wonder. I have a sense of cosmic wonder. Um, it's wonderful, <laughs> no pun intended. But that sense of wonder is an evidence of God. Even if there was a God that intentionally gave me a sense or forced a sense of wonder upon me, the sense of wonder itself isn't strong evidence for God. Uh, it's not strong evidence for anything other than we have minds that care about things. He went on then to talk, well, he didn't really talk, he didn't go into detail on any of these. This was like a shotgun super gish gallop of here are all the things and none of them count as strong evidence. So it was cosmic wonder, inferred design, a virgin birth, the speed of light, fine tuning, uh, Multiple, uh, the, the fact that scientists, he said, had to create the multiverse in order to explain stuff, which is irrelevant because whether or not the multiverse is, a, is true, the multiverse proposition is true, which I'm not convinced it is. It's speculative science, but it's interesting and it could be a solution. But it wasn't just done to say, well, if it's not God, then what? We'll invent a multiverse. It was to show that there are potential explanations 
that we may or may not be able to demonstrate, but that don't require us to go leaping to supernatural in, in that sense. He then went on to talk about morals, um, but he didn't say anything about them. And the truth is, we don't agree on morality. And so if you and I don't agree on morality, then you saying morality is evidence for God is just nonsense. Because my morality, my views about morality, isn't evidence for God. Um, he talked about how our opinions on morals were schizophrenic, um, that God serves as a foundation. Um, and what, I'm, what I do here, I, I can't really show you too well because it wouldn't be good to read, but as I jot down notes of specific things that were said, I circle things that I, I know are important that I want to go back to when I'm actually doing my response. And sometimes I'll put a check mark next to something where this like instant defeats itself. You can just mention and show it. And so I got through all that. On the back side, it's where he talked about God as a foundation for anything or everything um, and, and for the, this morality. And the note that I have underneath it, underneath God, is it says, has said nothing. And this is because it's very important. We just run with our, what we're presented with. And so if somebody says, well, God said it was wrong to kill. Hang on. When did God say this? I'm not even aware that there is a God or that God has said anything or communicate with anybody. So you've got a lot of work to do before you can come in here and say, God said this, because I don't have any reason to think that a God said anything. And even if it did, God did say something, that doesn't mean that it's right or that I agree with it. Um, and certainly, I would say that God saying something would be the strongest evidence I can think of for God. And we don't have that. Then he listed it, rattled off human rights, um, emotion, beauty, the complexity of the Bible, um, and then he got through that list of stuff without talking about any of it, without presenting any of it. It was just, here's this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And in my view, you can't explain that with chance, therefore God. And he's like, that's not direct evidence. He acknowledges at the end of his, near the end of his opening statement, that nothing he's presented is direct evidence. Um, but that he wants to have eternal hope and a possibility of heaven an explanation for death. How? All of that is fine. Stuart is a human being like the rest of us. He has his concerns and he'd like explanations. He'd like for there to be hope for tomorrow. He'd like for there to, to be an eternal life. He'd like for death not to be the answer. He'd like for there to be justice. He'd like for there to be a foundation for morals. He'd like that for that to not be the result of chance. Uh, and by the way, not everything is chance, just because it's not directed by a God. We, we do a lot of directing, but there's tons of order in the universe that's not chance. Evolution isn't chance. The chance part of evolution is perhaps what can be described as random mutations, but natural selection isn't chance. It's order. It is a, a directive of, hey, this is the temperature. If you can't survive in this temperature, you're going to die. And if you can survive in this temperature, <laughs> you will live to pass on your genes. Um, but Stuart didn't present weak evidence or strong evidence. What he presented was a very human portrayal of doubts and fears that religions quite often do a really good job of placating and acting as pacifier for it, but they don't actually offer any explanation. But when I say that the take this, this one page of notes changed some things, I don't tend to take notes when I'm on the atheist experience or the hang-up. On the hang-up, I have a couple times. But I don't tend to take notes because I decided probably after a year or so that interrupting for clarity was better. I, I get it. It's frustrating. Some people hate it. But the truth is, what was happening was I would let someone start talking. We'd let them talk for several minutes. Then we'd go back and challenge one of the first things they said. And then they would say, well, that's not what I said. Well, I can't rewind it live. Um, Although someday that would be really nice. Or they would say, ah, well, that's what you heard, or that's not what I meant. Here, let me clarify. And then they go on for a few more minutes, and it just keeps going. And it was turning the show into a, they talk, we object, they talk more, we object. And so I decided, okay, it's probably better for me to interrupt to get clarification, um, to be the advocate for the audience. I'm still going to do that. That's not going to change. But what I am going to start doing is taking more notes on AXP. Um, because 
if I jot down the thing that I was going to object to, and only the thing that I was going to object to, I don't need to take notes on everything a caller says, but if they say something where I would have said, hang on, hang on, let me interrupt right here. No, 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 pause right here. I, I, I just want to get this defined. In those cases, I think I'm just going to use the note taking and see if that makes it easier to say, okay, you said a lot, but I want to go back to this and I noted this down. You said this and I object and we need to define that. I think it could be better. It may not be as entertaining for some. Um, and I've tried it before and it doesn't always work. And I'm not going to pretend I'm the best note taker. But what I can say is that I sat there and I took good notes for that debate um, and then we halted it. We did the, the whole debate over again later and his opening was a little bit different but covered a lot of some of the, the same areas and we talked about most of these areas in the debate. When it comes to debates, A, defining terms is a big deal. And B, having a plan as I've talked about before is also a pretty big deal. And getting people to acknowledge what they've actually said without having the, the advantage of instant replay means that I have to do a better job taking notes. And so that change is going to be coming. But if you're taking notes, you may want to think about in your debates, trying to come up with a system of notes. Mine is free form. I know what it means. It's not like I have written rules. I might change it on occasion. Instead of circling this, I might put a line through that as you don't need to address that. But it's really simple bullet point topics and subjects. There's not a sentence on here. Like here, I will read you every word on both sides of this. It won't take long. Strong evidence, Stuart Connectly. Best evidence is Jesus Christ. I'm not a mythicist. Can't get watertight. Jesus is closest. Rational and square with experience. Use understanding of experience. Not a scientific question. Cosmic wonder, me too. Uh, inferred design, virgin birth. Jesus exists if so is evidence for that and not divine. That's me saying Jesus, if he exists, is evidence that Jesus existed, not that Jesus was divine. Uh, speed of light. I don't even know what that word is under speed of light. Then fine-tuning multiverse. Morals, we don't agree. Opinion about morals, schizophrenic. God is foundation, he said nothing. Human rights, emotional beauty, Bible complexity. That's not direct evidence. Hope and death, eternal hope. Uh, possibility of heaven, normative. That's every word except for the one I couldn't read that's on that page. And some of it, if I look at it next week, I won't remember what was said. But during the debate, I will. It's like, ah, you mentioned virgin birth. What evidence do you have that there was a virgin birth? What evidence do you have that there could be a virgin birth? What, what, what evidence? Uh, because all I see is a story in Matthew where he's trying to fulfill some prophecy in Isaiah that he kind of gets wrong, and that's where... Uh, the virgin thing come from. But we didn't get to get in that. But taking notes, I'm, I'm not the best at it. I don't have a plan. Uh, I do it when I think it's necessary. Especially, I do it in every m debate where, they're, where I know they're going to talk for 15 minutes because, quite frankly, I can't remember everything that they said in 10 or 15 minutes. Without notes, I would be doing what some other people are doing, which is not paying attention to what my opponent said and not responding to it, but just showing up to deliver my shtick. Well, I don't exist for shtick. If I'm going to do a debate, I'm going to listen to what my opponent actually says and address it. And I'm going to try to do it as fair as I can. I'm going to try to do it in, in, without any uh, straw manning and an attempt to steel man it, which is why if you go back and listen to some of those modern day debates, quite often somebody will ask me to steel man my opponent's position and they'll ask my opponent to steel man my position. Uh, to date, every time I've steel manned my opponent's position, I don't recall any objection from them. And yet I don't know that any, well, Stuart did a pretty good job of steel manning me, probably better than most people. In, in every other circumstance where somebody's tried to steel man my position, I've had a serious objection. And it, sometimes it's the difference between believe in versus believe that. Sometimes it's the difference between I am not convinced of guilt versus I am convinced of innocence, that sort of thing. Um, you know, those can be subtle. But I'm going to try using notes with AXP. Anyway, I know this year has been a mess. This is the final video uh, of this year for Atheist Debates Project. But you know what? The only thing that changes is the calendar rolls over a year. I change the date at the bottom. And next month, not only do I have two different debates um, and potential debate uh, reviews of those, but there's several other topics that are coming up that we'll be putting out on Atheist Debates Project as well. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.